Uh, well, welcome. It's very nice to see so many people here to find out about how and why Facebook is eating the world. My name's Tim Lewins. I'm the Deputy Director of CRASH, the Centre for Research in Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities, which is uh, responsible for putting on these Humanitas lectures. Uh, and it's great that you've all come along for this uh, the first in this year's events in our series associated with the Humanitas Chair in Media. Now, as is always the case with the Humanitas events, we're extremely grateful to the Weidenfeld Hoffman Trust for their support, which makes all of these events possible. And it's, I think, particularly important now uh, to express our sadness at the death very recently of George Weidenfeld. This is the first Humanitas event that we've held in Cambridge since George Weidenfeld's death. We owe him a very great debt. Uh, Lord Weidenfeld devised the Humanitas program and his very formidable network of contacts and friends has enabled this program to take place. Uh, and in particular, this chair, the, the Humanitas Chair in Media, which uh, of course he uh, had a particular interest in, uh, has been made possible by the very generous support of the Blavatnik Family Foundation. So we also need to express on this particular occasion our debt to the Blavatnik Foundation. Uh, as you'll know, the Humanitas Chair in Media seeks to ask questions about the interrelated issues of journalism, freedom, and democracy, particularly in our increasingly digital age. And I think there's no one better qualified to talk about these things than this year's visiting professor, Emily Bell. Emily was born in Norfolk. She read jurisprudence Christ Church in Oxford. Uh, she's an academic now, but before she was an academic, a great part of her career was spent at Guardian News and Media. She was initially a reporter and then business editor at The Observer. And in 2000, she moved to take charge of The Guardian's network of websites. She was editor in chief across the Guardian websites. She was director of digital content for Guardian News and Media. And in that role, she really was a pioneer in developing uh, the Guardian's approach to multimedia formats, data, and social media ahead of more or less all other mainstream competitors and news outlets. And so she was really the person who oversaw a period in which The Guardian changed from being a comparatively modest British liberal newspaper, its transformation into one of the world's most prominent web presences. She won, or The Guardian won under her direction, four Webby Awards in five years for best newspaper on the web, and she also won many other prestigious UK industry awards. Since 2010, she's been professor of professional practice and also director of the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at the Columbia Journalism School. And partly for that reason, she embodies very well the Humanitas approach in which we try to bring together people who are at one and the same time practitioners in these areas of great importance, and also take a theoretical interest in these areas too. And of course she continues to write, and she continues to tweet, and she continues to blog about how journalism and the media are changing, and about the ongoing existential crisis in publishing. She's speaking today on the end of the news as we know it, how Facebook swallowed journalism. It's a very great pleasure to welcome the Humanitas Visiting Professor in Media, Emily Bell. Thank you very much indeed, 
Tim, and thank you everybody for um, coming out this afternoon, particularly when British weather has been reminding me that actually um, I don't necessarily want to move back here quite as badly as I thought I would. I thought I would. Uh, thanks very much indeed. Um, I'm incredibly honoured um, and it's a great, great privilege to be uh, here at Cambridge where I was not as an undergraduate. Um, uh, there is a Cambridge in um, America. Uh, so I've had lots of messages from people this week saying good luck at Harvard. Um, so uh, you the microphone off. Please. Oh, sorry, I've got to unmute myself. Yeah. <laughs> I have quite a loud voice even without yeah. microphone. There we go. Um, yes, yeah, so I've had lots of uh, good luck messages saying uh, congrats, do well at Harvard um, because, <laughs> because uh, Americans obviously are not completely cognizant of the rest of the world, um, and that's uh, that's that's something I'm going to be talking about. Bit today. Um, I also want to thank John uh, Norton, Professor Norton, um, who was a colleague of mine way back when, uh, when I was business editor on The Observer. And John was one of the very first journalists um, who wrote about the intersection of technology with the rest of what you might call real life, um, uh, at a time when everybody else writing about technology was really writing about gadgets. Uh, John was beginning to um, open minds and eyes about the possibilities and some of the... Um, existential threats of, of the web. Uh, and I'd like to thank St John's College uh, who have put me up um, and made me feel very welcome. Uh, so thank you very much indeed to St John's and Master Chris Dobson. Um, so uh, first talk in this series, um, the end of news as we know it, how Facebook swallowed journalism. Uh, an American colleague at uh, Columbia took one look at this and said, are you giving a religious talk? Uh, <laughs> to which I could pretty emphatically say no. Um, they said, well, there's a burning cross and everything. I said, no, 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 that's, that's, a, that's a Facebook. That's the Facebook lo logo. Um, so I've committed the great internet journalism crime of creating what we call a curiosity gap headline, which is where you say something in the headline, and then you uh, under-deliver on your promise to demonise um, to demonise the said uh, institution. Um, my mother also rang me up and said, what is it, what, what are you doing, what, where, where are you talking? And I said, I'm a, I'm a humanitas. And she sounded a little scared and said, is that in Switzerland? And I said, no. <laughs> no, you're fine, it's not. It's not those people yet, Mum. Um, so, so I'm not actually, go I'm not here to deliver any sort of biblical warnings about uh, how terrible the social web is. Um, or how uh, we should be worried um, about these people coming from our media. In fact, probably uh, quite the opposite. But um, something really dramatic is actually happening to our media landscape. Uh, it's happening to the public sphere, and it's happening to our journalism, journalism industry. And I think it's happening without most of us really actually noticing what's going on, and it's certainly happening without the level of public scrutiny and debate that it really deserves. Um, our news ecosystem, I would argue, has changed more dramatically in the past five years than it has in the previous 500. Now, you may think that that's a rather tall claim, given that we've gone through uh, scribes and coffee houses and the Fourth Estate and the Peanut Gallery, uh, and then we've gone into uh, broadcast television. Surely that was a bigger upheaval. Surely all of those things. Surely the internet in 1995. Well, I don't think so. I think that we're, we're just going through right now something which uh, completely upends um, how we've thought about and how we've practiced journalism uh, in the past 200 years and how publishing has happened in the past 500 years. Um, we're seeing huge leaps in technical capability, virtual reality, live video, artificially intelligent news bots. I got my news this morning from a robot that uh, sends me a message. Um, and it's simply an automated system. But because it sends me with a cute picture of a robot waving and emojis at the end of it, I tend to read it, which I know is facile, um, but I do. Uh, so we're seeing these controls, we're seeing these changes in technology. We're also seeing changing control and financing, which is uh, putting the future of the publishing ecosystem into the hands of very, very few people, nearly all of whom are, are, are resident on the west coast of America. Um, and they now control the destiny for many. Social media hasn't just swallowed journalism. Um, it swallowed everything else as well. Uh, it's swallowing political campaigns, banking systems, personal histories, the leisure industry, retail, even government and security. Uh, the phone in our pocket is our portal to the world. 
And I think for many, this, uh, for many reasons, this actually heralds an incredibly exciting opportunity, both for education uh, and for information, for media uh, and for connection. But also there are lots of uh, existential risks um, it brings with it. So questions really, uh, I think, today are, should we be accepting those risks? Do we really understand what they are? Are we working hard enough to interrogate new systems of power? Uh, and do we have the scale to challenge government? That, that, that actually have the, these, these new systems of power have the scale to challenge governments. Um, but they're also largely unaccountable except to the markets. And they're almost entirely opaque uh, uh, and designed to be so. Um, so what I want to talk about today is not social media swallowing the whole world, um, but actually about that subsidiary and what, what its impact is on the field that I come from, which is, is journalism. Um, let's start with a topical story that does, in fact, involve a church. Here we go. Um, so it's been a really good week for the image, public image of journalism. These very handsome and attractive people are uh, the stars of Spotlight, um, the movie which has just picked up uh, the... Best Picture Oscar. How many people have seen it? Oh my goodness, that's, a, that's actually quite a high count here. How many people thought it was the best picture they saw last year? Nobody, apart from me, I did. Um, and well done, that's good, you're my favourite already. Uh, I'd just like to say nobody slept in a dead horse during this film, which made it infinitely better than The Revenant. Um, so... So the reason I'm starting with Spotlight is this. First of all, um, it's, a, it's a, a, a love letter to investigative journalism, and journalists can feel a vicarious glow of um, uh, goodness about their profession, even as they slot another Kardashian into the Daily Mail's sidebar of shame. Uh, we can all celebrate the greatness of our, our field. Um, but the work of the uh, investigative team at, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Spotlight team at Boston Globe in 2002 uncovered uh, the child abuse that had been going on and laundered really through uh, a network of priests in the local Catholic church. Um, it won a Pulitzer Prize in 2003. Uh, it's been held up as a, an example of how um, shoe leather reporting uh, of serious issues uh, is something that we should all aspire to and something that we should hold very dear. Uh, however, at the time that something that happened off camera that uh, you won't see in the film is the other story that was being told about journalism um, at the same time that uh, the Spotlight team were doing their thing. Um, so the Globe was bought in 1993, that's 10 years before the investigation by the New York Times company, for a billion dollars. Then, when it's Pulitzer Prize in 2003, in 2013, two years ago, it was sold again by the New York Times company, whose business, business it is to uh, maintain and make profit from newspapers, to a businessman called John Henry for $70,000. So uh, in the sweep of 20 years you have an august news brand which has lost more than 90% of its value. Uh, and yet, it's also scaled the peaks of journalistic excellence. Uh, and we'd always been told, if you do brilliant journalism, you will make money. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that's not true. Um, in fact, in many cases, the exact opposite is true. Um, it's also the case that two months after the Globe broke possibly their most significant story in terms of that they were able to produce uh, a, a victim of abuse, um, and they published that story in August 2002. Uh, in September 2002, Google News launched, which changed the way that people found and shared news on the internet. Um, and actually, right at the end of the film, if you, if you go and sit and you sort of sit all the way through it, um, right at the end of the film, there is a little sort of cameo, if you like, which explains, as the, as the papers thunder off the presses, it also explains that were it not for the internet, probably this story would have stayed as a local story. Uh, it wouldn't have reached the audience that it reached. It wouldn't have triggered questions in other communities about whether, in fact, these experiences were shared. It would not have become the same story that it did. It would not have had the impact that it had. So, in a way, this is the paradox of publishing, which is you are given through 
the web, the most incredible tools to do and make and disseminate journalism. Uh, and at the same time, this is happening. Let me just... Uh, which is, this is what happened to advertising revenues in American newspapers between 2003 and 2011. Um, so this, again, is just as the uh, Globe was winning its Pulitzer. Uh, you can see their sort of inexorable decline. Uh, and that's in all areas. That's in the retail, what they call retail advertising, that's in national advertising, and that's in classified local advertising. Um, and so the Boston Globe was not alone in this either. Um, the Washington Post... So the paper, which is now edited by Marty Barron, who is the Lee Schreiber, very, who incidentally is exactly like the Lee Schreiber character in Spotlight. Marty Barron now, is now editor of the Washington Post. The Washington Post, as you know, broke, woke, broke Watergate uh, in the early 70s. Um, in 2013, the same year that the Times was selling the Globe for $70 million dollars, uh, the Graham family, which had owned uh, the Post right throughout its glory years, decided that it couldn't fund what it needed to do to the Post to get it into the next phase of its future. And it sold it for $250 million, slightly more than $70 million, but still not very much money, uh, to Jeff Bezos, who is the founder of Amazon. So again, there's a kind of a, a sort of a parable there about the um, great families of American newspapers uh, giving up. Um, not because they don't love print, uh, not because they don't love journalism, but just because the economics of the business were becoming too intractably difficult to cope with. Um, so two significant things have happened. So when I said I think more has happened in the past five years than happened in the past 500, um, mostly this is the impact of social media. Uh, how many people here or have a social media account of any description. So does anybody not? Is anybody completely off the grid? Oh, congratulations. I would keep it that way if I was you. They do terrible things with your data. Um, so, so you're very representative. You, 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 I would say, are representative. You know, 98% of the world now has some sort of presence or connection with. And, and what's more, it's actually quite difficult not to have a presence on social media. Um, if you want to hold down a job, uh, if you... Uh, are connected, uh, if you're at school, you know, my high school age son uh, was a holdout, so I don't want a Facebook profile, I don't believe in those things, they're all wellian, he gets to high school, he finds that actually if you belong to clubs or organisations, or you want to find that information about homework, the way that people do it is through, is through Facebook. Um, so, news publishers, because we've had this huge uh, explosion in the use of social media. News publishers have actually lost control of distribution for the first time. So when I'm saying this is a really, really big change, the biggest part of that change is that we no longer have any control over where our stories end up. You know, we don't package them up and put them on the streets uh, and have the trucks rolling out the factories anymore. Um, you can't even predict, you know, where your clip for the six o'clock news is going to end up. You don't know who's going to watch it. You don't know how it's going to get there. Um, the chances are it's probably going to be intermediated by something like a Facebook feed. Um, new news companies who have popped up in the last five to ten years, and I'd include, Bu include BuzzFeed, I'd include uh, Vox Media, um, Fusion is another new brand that's popped up, have actually built their entire journalistic operations around the idea that this will be, you, you'll have to distribute through social media to have a presence. Um, and the second inevitable outcome, if you like, of this sort of uh, increase um, is that the social media companies have become incredibly powerful. Uh, now, that sort of seems like an obvious thing to say, but, you know, journalism has a certain amount of impact in the outside world, but it's lost a lot of, it's lost a lot of its economic power and lost, lost quite a lot of its uh, political power as well. So um, the largest of the social media companies, uh, and I'd include in that Google that owns YouTube, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and even second-order companies like Twitter, Snapchat, um, and emerging app companies. Who, who here uses WhatsApp? See, everybody here uses WhatsApp. Sorry, this is, this is actually what um, technology is doing to newspapers. It's rather different from the uh, Facebook, uh, from what, what Facebook is doing to them. Um, so everybody here uses, so uh, hands, 
everybody uses WhatsApp. WhatsApp is, is of course, as you know, like Instagram owned by Facebook. Uh, so we have this, uh, we have these, these, these companies of enormous size with huge numbers of users. Just sort of put this up here because it's always worth reminding ourselves what we're talking about. So Facebook has 1.5 active billion users, it says, uh, around the world. 1.5 billion. So this is in a world where having an, a television audience of 20 million is unimaginably huge for the UK. That's a sort of an England-Germany quarterfinal in which England lose on penalties. That's that sort of order. That's a kind of a really good royal wedding, like one of the major ones, not one of the minor <laughs> ones. Um, and 1.5 billion active users on Facebook. What's that? 800 million. Actually, I read something the other day that says this number is already out of date, but it's a billion. It's tipping a billion. Also owned by Facebook. Um, LinkedIn. Who here uses LinkedIn? Oh, I hate LinkedIn. I'm on it, but I hate it. Um, 350 million. Um, and it's required. And, and uh, Instagram, I had to update that. That was 300 million last time I put this slide up. It's now 400 million. Uh, Twitter is in real trouble because it can't grow fast enough. It's only got... 300 million users, these, sort of these, these economies of scale. Uh, and then Snapchat at 100 million. How many people here have Snapchat on their phones? Yes, yes I'm looking for the students in the audience. So if there's a few of you have Snapchat. Um, Snapchat, I caused a scandal with my students by telling them all to install Snapchat. And one of them actually said, I did not come to Columbia to learn how to use Snapchat. And I said, well, that's a shame because we're going to teach you. Um, it's actually a bit, an incredibly powerful and fast-growing storytelling system. And if you want to reach, put your hands up again, those people, which I believe lots of advertisers do because they're young and attractive and they spend lots of money. Um, if you want to reach those people, you have to be now on one of these platforms if you're an, adver if you're an advertiser or your or, or or your news company. So um, we have these small number of extremely powerful companies. Um, so our careful curation, the, the, the UK has curated its, its media market very carefully. How many people are aware at the moment that, for instance, the BBC is going through a charter renewal? Okay, so you all know that, right? That's, that's good. How many people here know a great deal about Facebook instant articles? So with the exception of Professor Norton, that's maybe good. Um, but, so that's good for the purpose of my lecture. It's terrible for the state of democracy and media ownership and control and the financing of journalism and everything else. It is terrible that you don't know about that. And it's not your fault. It's actually my fault. And there isn't a, an editor here who I can point the finger at, but it is, it is, it is a problematic that we aren't recognising where this um, extreme sort of shift power... Because I know some of you are thinking, I, mm, does, this, does this stuff really matter? I mean, these seem like big, big numbers, but does it really matter? Um, so let me just sort of tell you, I think, what, expand on this power shift and talk about a little bit about why it's happened so quickly. So uh, really it's about Moore's Law. Does anyone want to explain what Moore's Law is? Yes. Yes, halving and double. Exactly. It's, like, it's, 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 it's basically our ability to store more and more and more for less and less and less um, in terms of data. So Moore's law has meant that one of these things is essentially now uh, able to contain sort of most of our lives quite, quite effectively. Um, I got that bit right, John, didn't I? Just checking. And it's processing power. Sorry, the other part of it is processing power, which is processing power is then up to the task of processing all the data that you can now access through this. Um, so what's happened is uh, we have... How many people here have smartphones? Sorry, this is like a... I'm actually in disguise. I'm actually sort of like a sort of a market <laughs> researcher. Um, so we all have one of these, basically. Does anyone not have one of these? Okay, Inter very good, interesting. Um, so you are ruining my talk at this stage because I was going to say everybody, because everybody has one of these. Um, the penetration of smartphones in the States now is over 70%, um, and it's growing quickly. 
I don't know what the penetration is here. I may have a chart on that coming up. I'm not quite sure. I can't remember. Um, and we all have apps installed, right? So I counted my apps this morning. I have 70, which uh, is what happens when you share your account with a teenage child who doesn't know how to decouple. Um, so I, apparently, I watch a lot of basketball. Um, I play an awful lot of games. Uh, there were some terrible things on my Spotify account. Um, but I have 70. Uh, I'm unusual in that regard. Most people have 36 apps installed uh, on their smart, smartphone. Um, but actually, kind of, you know, the numbers of apps, this is, this is Google data. They, own, uh, they, they operate the Android platform. Um, 26%. So, you know, that's kind of under 10, uh, probably about sort of five or six for most people, um, are used daily. So, uh, again, it's kind of a, it's, it's obeying the 80 20 rule of sort of 80% of the use goes to 20, 25% of the, uh, of the installed base. Um, and this is important. This is an important fact. So, it, however many of apps you have on here, you're only ever going to use uh, a small number. Um, and because of this, uh, there we go, yes, rise of smartphones. Actually, right, yes, smartphones are now penetrating 86% up from uh, 52% in America among millennials. So if you, if you like, this is, this is what the future looks like, which is um, more millennials now carry around smartphones than actually have laptops. Uh, it's pretty much completely killed um, personal uh, high fives or whatever they call them uh, these days, iPods. Uh, it's really sort of um, dinged console games, uh, iPads, sort of iPads, tablets are growing, um, but not at the same rate as the iPhone. Uh, and even e-books, people are now, there's a great piece in the Wall Street Journal about how, which uh, I hope uh, uh, George Wiedenfeld would have enjoyed, about how people are now reading books, whole books on their phones. Um, so uh, tablets are also uh, suffering as well. So we have this sort of incredible rise of, of, of the mobile phone. And this is an important chart, because this is how much time we spend on online devices every day. Uh, and it's, I know it depends to the American market, but the trends are pretty much the same everywhere, which is between 2008 and 2015, you can see how much time. The green is mobile, the blue is desktop. So effectively, our screen time has doubled in the space of 10 years. So in, in the UK, 10 years ago, you would be watching or consuming... 10 hours, roughly, uh, a week of um, screen time. Um, now, it would be 20. Uh, at its peak, television viewing was about 24 hours a week. Uh, and that's with no other competing media. And people use their phones uh, while they're watching television. They use their phones now um, for everything. If you get onto a train carriage and you look around for a newspaper, you won't see one. You'll see people scrolling through their phones. So... As the amount of time that we spend increases, uh, the competition really for um, spending time within those apps is, is very, very fierce. Uh, Pew Research Centre has a look at sort of what people are doing with this time. Uh, and when you break down sort of how people use apps on their phone, by far and away the greatest chunk of that is within social media. So sort of nearly 40% or so is actually within what they call a social app. So that would be Twitter. It would be Facebook. Uh, it might be Snapchat. Um, these are the absolute sort of dominant apps, more than retail, more than um, sometimes messaging is also a significant part of that. But as we know, messaging is often part of actually a social platform as well. So um, spending time in the apps, if you want to get in front of an audience, uh, when you ask people how much time they spend on news or sport or weather apps, it comes out at sort of somewhere around 3%, maybe less than 3%. So unless you're integrated into the social flow of somebody's day and you're a news provider, the chances that you're actually sort of getting in front of them um, on a regular basis is low. So to recap, um, people are using their phones, smartphones for everything. It's mostly through apps, and it's particular through social messaging apps, which are Facebook, WhatsApp, Snapchat, Twitter. Um, and the competition for time within those apps is intense. Uh, and each platform really wants um, to keep people within it. Because for the longer you keep somebody within your app, the more data you find out about them, the more you can see who their friends are, what they like, what they're buying. Uh, you can trace them in and out of 
different articles as long as they stay within the app. The moment they click out of it, they may have some tracking software following them, but also you may lose them. So uh, for the point of view of your advertisers, for the point of view of your business, you're really trying to hang on to those people. Um, journalism and the delivery of news has become an important part of this battle for attention on mobile. Um, people are curious about what's going on in the world right now. It's actually a very sticky thing. Um, they want to know what their friends have been doing. They want to know how Donald Trump did on Super Tuesday. So that would be really quite well. Um, so in this competition for attention, what we like to think of as the four horsemen of the apocalypse who are all battling for mobile attention and use. Because if you don't, uh, the, the feeling is if you don't win this market you effectively won't win any market. So this is, this is why it's so important. It's not just that this is an alternative industry to uh, doing something else, being a broadcaster. It's that if you, can't ha if you don't dominate mobile, you will not have a business. And that's why Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, and to some extent Microsoft, though they're a little, far be little further behind in the mobile game, are having a prolonged and torrid war uh, over whose platforms technologies, even ideologies, are actually going to win this. Um, I think this is fierce. I mean, it's fiercer, really, than the newspaper wars in the 70s or the broadcast in the, in the 60s or the, the broadcast television wars in the 70s. Uh, so, actually, in the last year, something else interesting has happened to um, journalism, which is it's become... Uh, suddenly, publishers have become really sought after by social uh, media companies. Um, it started a year ago with this thing called Snapchat Discover, which is a rather old-fashioned, uh, almost a bit like an old TV. Um, each of these publishers uh, is a, has a channel within Snap, what they call Snapchat Discover, uh, which is a screen on this messaging app. And each one of these media properties publishes stories uh, straight onto the Snapchat platform. So in other words, they might take what they've done in the Daily Mail or... Sky Sports, but they have to make it um, especially sort of swipeable, uh, and they use lots of pictures, they use lots of graphics, they use a bit of, uh, they use a bit of video, um, and Snapchat sort of launched this with thirteen, what they call thirteen slots, so basically thirteen channels for these, and people's uh, the 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 amount of traffic that went back to publishers really exploded. It was suddenly, oh, my God, all these 16-year-olds will actually spend hours swiping through Cosmo pictures. Um, so th this kicked off a war to include um, digital publishers uh, within the sort of the walls of, of social, social media. So this came first in January last year. Then Facebook, that had actually been thinking about doing something similar to Snapchat Discover, uh, got their act together, and they launched something called Facebook Instant Articles. So you good people don't know what face, Facebook Instant Articles is. Uh, how, how many people know what they are? Nobody. Oh, yes, no one, too. Um, so if you have a newspaper, and your newspaper is on the web, and you go onto Facebook and somebody sends you a link to an article that you like, uh, and you click on it and you read it, in the olden days, that would have gone back to the newspaper's website. Um, and Facebook uh, don't like that happening uh, for two reasons. One of which is they lose your time and attention on their app. Uh, but the second reason is because it's actually rather slow to load. Uh, news organisations are not very good at making um, uh, pages that uh, work well for people on mobile phones. Uh, that's why Snapchat Discover was actually such a sort of success for publishers because it was what they call native to the environment. So uh, Facebook Instant Articles mean that instead of publishing, you can publish to your website, but simultaneously your article will appear on a page with the same design and everything, but on a page in Facebook. So it's no longer taking you outside, it's keeping you within Facebook. And so they rolled out this proposition to publishers saying... Six of you, and I think they picked The Guardian, The New York Times, National Geographic, uh, and two or three others, so can, can trial this. Um, they rolled it out, I think, in March last year, uh, February, March last year. Uh, in September, the Washington Post, remember, that was sold two years ago because it couldn't make, make any money, Jeff Bezos said, we're going to put everything onto Facebook Instant Articles. We're going to go what they call all in. 
So in other words, now, if you want to read the Washington Post, you can read all of it, but it's within Facebook. And the way that those pages reach you is by either you liking the Washington Post page or by your friends sending you liking links as well, or by Facebook just deciding that you should see it. So we have instant articles rolling out in March. We then have Google. Don't forget, this is a war about who controls the mobile, who controls your apps. So Google then launched something called the Digital News Initiative, uh, and Google, lab, Google News Labs, which was uh, romancing publishers and saying, don't go to Facebook, because I'll get Emily. Well, you can go to Facebook, but we will make it possible to, for your pages to load really quickly, which had been one of the problems that um, publishers had had. That's why Facebook Instant Articles was appealing to them. Uh, and we will make it within Google, um, and uh, you can put all, of your, put all of your articles into that system. Uh, as well. You can still keep them on your own website, which will be very slow, and nobody will ever go there, and nobody will look at your articles on your own website. But you can also go through our system. You don't have to be just on Snapchat Discover, just on Facebook Instance. Um, then in September, Apple, the largest company in America, says, we're going to launch a, a, a news app, a news reader. Does anybody here look at Apple News? You're very good. You have everything. You literally look at everything. This is amazing. Um, they launched Apple News, which is meant to be like a very swift aggregator of all this news. Again, it's basically putting all of your content as a publisher into uh, the Apple system, which will show your articles very quickly to other people. It doesn't have a social component to it. But again, it was Apple saying, we must have something uh, that keeps people within the app. And then Twitter hired for something called Project Lightning and launched Moments, which is, if you're on Twitter and you go to Moments, it's a terrible product, but um, it's really, again, telling you those stories without you ever having to leave the app. These are sort of, these, you know, these were suddenly in the last year, this has all happened in the last 12 months. Uh, so from really sort of being not fully integrated with the social web, uh, publishers uh, have been invited to be, absolutely not just fully integrated, but to hand over all of their journalism. Um, and actually, sort of, you know, they've been increasingly deciding that that's the way they should go. Figures that were out in December said that the early trialists of Facebook Instant Articles were seeing three or four times the traffic to Instant Articles than they were back to their own websites for the, for, for the same material. So in other words, the early testing suggests that actually these things are, and particularly Facebook, is working. Um, but something else was happening at the same time that we were getting all these shiny new toys. It sounds very promising, this, to say, well, what's the problem? Publishers now have this new home. Um, it's great that they're integrated with the social web um, because we can all maintain our independence, right? We can maintain our presence as separate publishers. Not so fast. Uh, at the same time, that Apple was launching Apple News in September. It also allowed ad, what they call ad-blocking software to be listed in the Apple Store for the first time. Now, ad-blocking software is the thing that stops you from seeing any of those terrible ads that pop up as you scroll through your uh, phone. It stops your data usage being so high, it costs you less money. Uh, and people, of course, like using them because uh, ads are intrusive and annoying. Um, and what this, what this meant was that at the same time that you were being enticed to publish directly into apps, which actually largely are not affected by ad blockers, you were having one of the alternative... Uh, streams of revenue, in other words, from your own mobile publishing, taken away. So if you combine that, so if you combine the idea that all use is going to mobile phones, if you're going to be seen as a news publisher, you have to be on mobile. You combine that with the fact that you're more easily seen if you go, to a social, go through a social app or a, 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 a separate filter. And then if you don't do that, and you're trying to make money through advertising, there is now software listed by Apple that has its own news product, which stops you from making any money at all. Um, so, you know, we're seeing the use of medium-sized carrots and very big sticks, uh, which is driving commercial publishers into, sometimes willingly, uh, into this new world. Um, what would you do, then, if you're a commercial publisher? There are probably three 
possibilities. First of all, um, just embrace it. Just go with it. Just say, publishing is over. That's happened. Uh, the money that you can make now from being an independent publisher uh, outside this system is, is, is uncertain and it's very low. Uh, as a publisher said to me of a major news organisation in the States, we've looked at the figures that we get back from instant articles. We've looked at the figures we're likely to get from mobile advertising. For us, we honestly don't know how it could be worse. We've only got things to gain through going all in with, uh, with instant <laughs> articles. Um, but there are risks. You lose absolute control of, you lose that link between yourself and the audience. You lose, uh, you get some of your own data back, but you lose sight of how your stories are being shared or read in comparison to other people's stories. Uh, and you give a lot of your valuable relationship data to Facebook as well. Um, the second option is to build another business completely and revenues away from distributed platforms. So in other words, the second option is basically not to be in publishing uh, in the traditional sense at all, but actually to start to build a membership business or a subscription business or an events business or uh, some other type of revenue uh, across subsidy. Uh, you know, I sit on the board of The Guardian. The Guardian is uh, financed by the endowment from a uh, trust uh, which is financed by the sale of, of, of businesses that it's previously owned. Um, I think that model, and I think the not-for-profit model, is going to just grow uh, in terms of news delivery for all these reasons. Um, and then the third, of course, is to make advertising that doesn't look like advertising at all. So if you remember how important it is, for all of these reasons, to integrate uh, your experience with um, mobile to not be blocked by an ad blocker uh, and to get in front of people, then the thing to do is to actually make advertising that just looks like editorial. So the growth of what we call native advertising has been uh, huge. It's now 22% um, of mobile, what we call mobile display advertising, which is a really significant proportion considering that five years ago this wasn't a business at all. Um, uh, and... In fact, companies like BuzzFeed and Vox, and well, particularly Vice, actually, which is not quite the same because it has a magazine as well, but companies like BuzzFeed and Vice have decided to re-engineer a completely different bit of the publishing chain. And what they're effectively becoming are engines for what we call native advertising, where you can't really tell. You should be able to tell if you're reading an ad or you're seeing a piece of journalism uh, or if it's a sponsored piece of content, or if it's been made by an advertiser. Sometimes, um, I think with the, the companies, the respectable companies, and I'd put Vice and BuzzFeed into that category, um, it's pretty clearly labelled. Sometimes with others, it's, it's not. So suddenly we're in a world where we don't quite know where our information is being paid for from. Uh, we don't quite know if it's an ad. We don't quite know if it's been sponsored. I actually did read something on BuzzFeed about how much... Uh, 24, reason, 24 ways to tell if you're a really outdoorsy person. And I don't think it was advertising, but there was a North Face coast in it twice. And I was like, ooh. <laughs> so, so, so we don't know. We don't know. It's very obscure. Um, and so this native advertising is uh, meaning that, that certain media companies are now just basically becoming ad agencies. So BuzzFeed is much more like Saatchi and Saatchi, say, in the 1980s, possibly, than it is like the New York Times, even though it does great journalism. The core of what it does is to get money from advertisers, uh, repackage it, and follow uh, its, what they call its social footprint. The reason you can do this and the reason that advertising agencies is failing is because you can't just go out and buy a bus site anymore. You know, if you have to be in a social app and you're Nike, uh, you have two ways of reaching your audience. Either you get everybody to like Nike, which is actually quite... We all feel a bit foolish, don't we? Even if we do really, really like something. I hate being caught out on Facebook where you've accidentally put your thumb on something and it crops up saying, Emily Bell likes, I don't know, sort of Tide or some sort of, like, washing powder. It's like, no, I don't like it. I use it, but I don't like it. It's just there. Um... But the, so you can either do that, and most people don't like brands in that way, or you can go through the social footprint that has been created by all the great journalism or cat memes or pictures of Sean Penn um, interviewing drug lords or whatever it is, however it is you've created your following, that's now available to advertisers. So the, the, the engine of a lot of uh, digital news businesses now 
is going to be effectively being in the advertising business. And of course, for those of us, you know, back to the church and state argument, for those of us who grew up with this idea that there was a very, very firm divide between what the advertising department did and what the editorial department did, this is a really uncomfortable new reality that we have to, um, that we have to grapple with. Quite a lot of publishers building their own destinations. Uh, Mark Thompson, formerly of the BBC, now of the New York Times, says it's really important that we do both. We have to distribute everywhere, but we also have to build our own strong presence. The New York Times can probably afford to invest in that. Lots and lots of other people can't. Um, so what's happening is not only have we seen this sort of shift, if you like, in, in power... Um, but we also are seeing sort of so much stuff now, both through publishers using these platforms more. Everybody here is a publisher. Every time you put something online, you're publishing. Acts of journalism are committed every day, not necessarily by journalists. Um, you now have tons and tons of videos and photos which people share, some of which are just very social. They're pictures of your cat or your children. Some of them are really important bits of news journalism. They might be capturing uh, a, 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 an attack in Paris. as that very famous piece of video of the gunman for Charlie Hebdo, uh, the, the gunman in the Charlie Hebdo attack, shooting the policeman in the street. The story of that uh, particular clip is that the man who shot it from his, um, from his uh, apartment window was just watching what was going on in the street, realised he had something really sort of uh, alarming um, and potentially important, did, as he said in interviews, I just did what I normally do, which is I just put it online. Ten minutes later, he'd thought through, is it a really good idea for me to have somebody shooting somebody I don't know dead in the street? Is it really a good idea for this to be linked to my profile? We don't know who these gunmen are. We don't know where they are. So he went back to take it down, but it was too late. Uh, and in the ten minutes it had been online, it had been taken by somebody else, it had been put on YouTube. And within the hour, he was watching his clip on the evening news, even though he would actually much rather nobody saw it at all. Um, which is, again, just a sort of a, 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 an example of how use is running ahead of how we're thinking about perhaps, you know, responsible publishing on these platforms. Um, so what we have is so much material that the companies who are publishing it, and this, this is where we don't really know what to think about Facebook, because Facebook, they're making us money, but they're also taking control away from the process. Um, we don't actually know how these companies are showing us the stories that are reaching us. So, for instance, this morning um, I had breakfast with my good friend uh, Bill Thompson of the BBC who said, ah, did you see that story yesterday um, about the BBC? Uh, and the answer was I didn't because I've been entirely reliant on my phone because I don't have TV uh, while I'm in Cambridge. And all of my news was really about the things that I had been reading about. So I had hundreds of stories about what was happening uh, with technology companies. I had lots and lots and lots of stories about Apple and the FBI. I didn't have any stories at all about, yet, about the BBC. And I didn't really know whether this was just because they hadn't been well covered or whether it was just because they weren't being shown to me in my feed because I hadn't indicated to the Facebook algorithms that I was uh, interested in them. Um, so we don't know how, which is a big problem actually democratically, if we don't know how stories are being uh, fed to people, we don't know how the algorithm is sorting them, we can't tell what the path is that they're taking, we don't know why certain stories are upweighted and others are downweighted. Facebook did a great job, actually, of saying, come and talk to us about our algorithm, we'll explain what it is. But even there, I think that they're behind the curve in really understanding um, why people liking the same things shouldn't, you know, is, is actually not necessarily the best way to sort out what news stories they're consuming. Um, and what this leads to, if you like, uh, this, this sort of algorithmic lack of transparency, no algorithmic accountability, uh, is really sort of significant questions about free speech and uh, how do we know that everybody is getting equal access? Uh, where is the transparency? Nobody's ever had completely equal access to the public sphere. But at least we've known, we've been able to ask questions about why did the editor do this? Uh, why did the BBC decide to have that person on in the morning and not this person? We have a debate about it. And uh, now we're not even really aware that it's happening. Um, only last week, actually, in the US, uh, a number of high-profile right-wing bloggers, um, and here's, here's one uh, 
uh, was suspended. Um, now, he's a kind of really unpleasant individual who is a self-confessed anti-feminist, which means that he's not going to be invited around to my house anytime soon. Um, and he expresses sort of pretty strong and, I think, sort of unpleasant views. Uh, this is now categorised as hate speech by Twitter. Uh, and it means that his account has been taken away. Uh, there have been other right-wing bloggers in the States just in the past couple of weeks saying, we're worried that we're being what they call shadow banned, which means that Twitter has the power, if it wants to, to mute uh, certain people so that when they tweet something, it's still published, it's just nobody sees it. You can see it on your timeline, it, doesn't necess- it just doesn't necessarily end up in front of anybody else's, in front of anybody else. Now, for politics, this is actually a really sort of significant thing because uh, Twitter has a small user base and it's a fairly rambunctious and, and, and terrible place to be if you don't like being an argumentative public figure. Um, but if you do like being an argumentative public figure, it's, hey, it's like, it's paradise. Um, and also it's a place where lots and lots of other media uh, actually commission their punditry from. So as a, a journalist in the US said to me, when you disappear on somewhere like Twitter, you really disappear. You know, you're not suddenly asked to appear on television shows. And again, this is a weakness, perhaps, in terms of how mainstream media or in terms of, 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 of our sort of the ways that we find our, our sources. Um, but it does mean that, you know, even on the left, I think, this kind of control has left people feeling slightly queasy uh, about, you know, what it means to put our public sphere into the hands of a small number of private companies because we don't really have an alternative at the moment. Um, And actually, sort of outside uh, existing laws, there's no restraint or compunction on any platform to restrict certain types of content to promote others. It's an unregulated field. Uh, And what the companies say is, well, we can't show you what is in our algorithm. We can't show you how you get access to uh, the news feed. Because if we did, then it would suddenly be full of sort of spam and uh, people trying to game it and doing bad things with it, and it's our commercial IP. Um, How much should we really care about this? So you might be thinking, really, is this actually important? Does this really matter? Well, again, 40% in America, 40% of adult Americans told the Pew Center last quarter that they get their political, they get some, they get their news of the day from uh, Facebook. Uh, 38% last week told Pew that Facebook was uh, their source of news for uh, what was happening in the political campaigns out there. 40% in a country the size of America, there's never been a media outlet that has had uh, that much share, audience share. It's like somebody saying, you know, it's, if, if Rupert Murdoch was owning one outlet that uh, was representing all of that sort of coverage of, of politics, we would be extremely alarmed, um, and rightfully so. So, you know, we know that we're handing parts of the public sphere over into these hands. We, we might well trust Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, I think, you know, again, I probably do trust Mark Zuckerberg more than I trust David Cameron, um, more than I trust Rupert Murdoch, uh, but I'm not sure that we should be s- building systems which are predicated on de- really... Um, delegating civic responsibilities to private companies. So in America, for instance, you know, this, this is also sort of Google are installing fiber in cities like Austin and Charlotte. Um, the uh, internet.org, or free basics as it's become known, is an offering that Facebook is making in um, uh, parts of the world where there are low levels of c- connectivity larger to, to, to sort of poorer populations. Um, and actually, two weeks ago, it was defeated in India by a group of um, civic activists who said, you know, we would much rather you didn't. And there was sort of this uproar, uh, and you saw a, a, a cultural conversation of the type you don't often see um, between uh, the investors and, and, and Facebook executives going, but how could you not want uh, free internet access for you know, the, 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 the poorest uh, in, in society were doing a good thing. And you had, you know, India not unreasonably saying, but we want to think about whether we want the next 100 million people to come online through Facebook, uh, which is a personal, personally, I think, is a very reasonable question. Um, 
So I do think that whilst we might trust these companies, we also, or, or whilst we might like these companies, we might find that they deliver fantastic services. Uh, we also know that all public speech and expression, we need to know that it's all going to be treated transparently, if not equally. Um, it's a basic requirement for functioning democracy to know how our information is reaching us and who is paying for it. Um, and for this to happen, there has to be some agreement about the responsibilities that we take for this. Uh, and this is perhaps shifting, maybe not quite quickly enough. So the people who built those companies didn't actually... I mean, this is the other thing to say, that Mark Zuckerberg does not want to be responsible for this. You know, this is something that has, if you like, happened to him without him going out and seeking it out. And in fact, last week, he was being interviewed by a previous um, uh, crash visiting lecturer, Matthias Doffner, who is the CEO of uh, Axel Springer in Germany. Um, and Doffner asked Zuckerberg, are you a publisher or a distribution platform? And Zuckerberg answered, definitely a distribution platform. Asked why he didn't wish to become a publisher, Zuckerberg responded, because we are a technology company, explaining that the new partnerships, so the instant articles, uh, that the new partnerships the company is building through these products um, are addressing exactly the fact that Facebook is emphatically not a publisher. But then when he was pressed on the role of Facebook in de defining, for instance, free speech, Zuckerberg said, while generally we believe in free speech and giving everyone as much ability to speak as possible, in practice there are lots of barriers to that, whether it's legal restrictions, technological restrictions, or you can't share what you want if you don't have access to the internet. And there are social restrictions where someone could be suppressing someone else's freedom to express themselves. So our North Star is that we want to give the most voice possible to the most people to which anyone who's been engaged in publishing might say, well, good luck with that. Um, defining what constitutes uh, some of these barriers, these conflicting barriers, is actually in itself an act of editing and also an act of politics. Uh, the, the, there is no such thing in, the, in this context as a technology company. You know, you are editing the world. The choices you're making about your technology is going to affect public discourse, uh, even if it's in the most light touch or you think it's at the most distant that you could possibly be, um, you're still making editorial choices. So um, Facebook, for instance, in the States, uh, has recently banned gun stores from advertising. I'm a fan of banning gun stores from advertising. I don't like the idea of walking down the street and being shot. I'm British. We don't do that sort of thing. Um, but in many states, selling guns is perfectly legal. But uh, Mark Zuckerberg says no. It doesn't align with our values. We're not going to allow these places to advertise uh, on here. Um, so that's, if you like, an editorial choice. That's exactly the same sort of choice that we might have made at The Guardian, which is well, no, no one actually wanting to sell guns ever advertised in The Guardian, to be honest. Um, and I don't think they ever would. However, uh, it is the sort of editorial choice we would make. We say this doesn't align with our brand. But if you are, if you are like trying to be all things to all people, it's very clear that there are certain people that would get access to uh, at the platform and other people who wouldn't. Um, and in Germany, uh, Facebook was under significant pressure to um, because it, it, it has been um, expunging hate speech against refugees, which again is something that I think we can all feel sort of very sympathetic about. But uh, it was caught out, or rather not caught out, but there was a, a page that was deleted, um, which... Uh, was taken off Facebook and there was a row in the States about well this is actually censorship and, and, and Facebook said no 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 it was just blocked for a completely different reason it was the algorithm that did it we didn't know uh, and it was probably right but again it raises a suspicion of uh, how do people make these decisions make these de make these decisions um, and is this really sort of you know what the public sphere is going to be like which is uh, a sort of a, 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 a kind of a an obscure place where we don't know how decisions are being made um, so in the courts in America at the moment, we have the FBI challenging Apple over the access uh, to the phone um, used by one of the shooters in San Bernardino. Um, yesterday, a Facebook executive was arrested in Brazil because he hadn't complied with a WhatsApp order, which came as a shock to Facebook because actually they don't have a WhatsApp office in Brazil, but they do have a Facebook office. So uh, the police just went ahead and arrested the uh, most senior executives they could find there. Um, and that made me think that actually sort of, you know, that what's happening 
um, is that even though Mark Zuckerberg doesn't want to be seen as a publisher, that's how he's being, if you like, categorized. And that's how these companies will find a lot of their um, employees being treated uh, and covered in a way that we've become very used to being covered in the press. Um, and I think that that's, again, sort of, if you think about you're not really in charge of your definitions, if you're Mark Zuckerberg, you can say we are a technology company, um, but you're still seen as having uh, control over disclosure. Uh, you're still seen as being um, an agent for uh, forces that don't want to be discovered. You're, you're, you're asked to exercise that power on behalf of the state. Um, last week, there was a meeting at the White House for entertainment and social media companies uh, under the banner of um, how we can brainstorm to counter terrorism which is this idea that because ISIS has proliferated so quickly through um, deploying very effective propaganda, somehow social media companies um, uh, should be part of that as well. So I'm just going to go through here. Here we go. The, um, uh, this co-opting of social media companies and entertainment companies um, to fight terrorism is a very uh, American um, if you like, sort of uh, conceit. Uh, and it is, as John Norton would call it, an uncomfortable piece of policy theatre. Uh, but is it really the place of social pa platforms to be co-opted? Um, I mean, actually, social platforms have responded pr pretty well. Uh, Twitter has got rid of 25,000 ISIS-related accounts. Facebook has said there will be no... Um, we won't tolerate where we find groups that are sympathetic or part of ISIS and we find them on our platform, we will get rid of those too. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, both Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg, Jack being the um, founder of uh, Twitter, Mark being the founder of Facebook, have found themselves at the, at the wrong end of um, one of ISIS's rather scary propaganda uh, campaigns, um, which does make one feel very exposed if you are uh, just a technology company. Um, so Terror terrorism is a salient example right now, but what's next? So will the government want to promote certain messages about its own foreign policy but keep others quiet? Should algorithms be regionally targeted to promote favourable stories about certain policy initiatives? Does all government propaganda get treated equally? Platforms which control the terms of expression, advertising, and even the speed of distribution internationally as well as within the, in the US have inherited the same pressures editors and publishers were subject to before them. Uh, and one reason for denying the role of publisher, if you're Mark Zuckerberg, is that it keeps away a whole host of really expensive duties traditionally assumed by those who distribute uh, information to the world. And actually one of the criticisms which I think has been very fairly levelled at social platforms is you're happy to be involved in the money-making part of the process. You're not so happy to be involved in parts of the process like actually paying journalists actually paying journalists insurance so they can go and report from places like Syria uh, or Yemen. You're not so fond of paying the legal bills that journalism incurs uh, and the publishing risk that you incur when you do difficult uh, stories about holding power to account. Um, so that cherry-picking, if you like, uh, is something which, if you look in, in this current nascent exper ex experiment with journalism, um, it would be really nice to see a significant shift uh, from the platform companies actually into paying for some of those more expensive parts of journalism. And it would be nice to see journalism engaging with social platforms as well to help uh, some of the executives negotiate a world where you will be imprisoned for what you do with information, where you will be targeted by propagandists uh, and by terrorists for bringing truth and light to the world. The reintermediation of information, which once looks as though it's going to be really fully democratised by the progress of the open web, is likely to make mechanisms for funding journalism get worse before they get better. And I think that this is why it's so important for us to have an open and transparent conversation about how these new relationships can actually deliver something of genuine value to all parts of the community. Um, when you look at the prospects ahead of us, uh, as I say, I think that um, Apple, Facebook, Google, Twitter, 
they all have to satisfy not the requirements of the free press, but the requirements of Wall Street, which are very different from the requirements of the free press. Uh, so I think it's fair to say um, it would not be too speculative uh, to suggest that journalism and publishing hasn't finished uh, its decline into unprofitability quite yet. Uh, I think we're going to see many more companies uh, shut a print, as we have with the Independent. 300 local newspapers have gone out of print, uh, if not completely off the web, within the last 10 years. I think that any, any outlet which currently hasn't found a sustainable model for uh, journalism is going to have to do so soon. Um, and that may well require uh, investment from uh, extremely rich people like those in Silicon Valley um, to uh, cre- keep the field sustainable um, because I'm not sure that the difficult, dirty and dangerous business of making journalism um, is ever actually going to be profitable again. Uh, and I think sort of to be sustainable, news companies have to radically alter their cost bases. Uh, so the next wave of media companies, and we see this a bit with BuzzFeed, is really to sort of uh, get rid of all of that cost of which distribution and publishing is, is part. And as the social media companies are offering you this, this free outlet, this free software, these bigger audiences, the um, impetus not just to uh, publish your articles on there, but also to think Facebook will take care of the technology, it will sell the advertising for me, is going to be really significant. So again... Uh, I don't think we've seen the... We're not at the end of that journey. I think we will see much fuller integration of uh, what we currently think of as journalism and publishing with the open web. I don't know that I've convinced you. I've only got, like, a few more paragraphs to do, to do that in. Um, so the leader of techn- leaders of technologies companies really do need, I think, to recognise that with great power comes great responsibility, um, which the National French Convention had in 1793 and then I think Spider-Man in 1962. Um, but the broader question for society is really whether social platforms and big tech can be trusted to be transparent, to be transparent enough. And if they can't be trusted, and I don't think we can leave this to trust, what mechanisms are open for us? The media uh, sector in the UK, and I know this because I used to write about it, is incredibly heavily regulated, actually. Um, and yet, there seems to be a complete absence of knowledge or public debate around some of the issues here, around this transfer of uh, economic power, of free speech, of the, public, of, the, of the public sphere to a small set of privately held American companies who are redrawing, if you like, uh, the rules of engagement. As I say, I don't say that as a criticism. I think they'll do it a lot better uh, than some of the people who've been doing it in the past. Um, I can't really understand how we can spend so long debating press regulation in this country and not touch on what's happening to distribution once. You can go through the whole of the Leveson report. You will find no mention of any of this, uh, and that happened within the last five years. Um, one pressing issue, I think, is how we should frame this with the, in the context of the current mauling of the BBC. Um, the BBC has a business model which is largely immune from death by Snapchat. Um, and it's got a rich history, actually, of thinking about how technology and content can combine for public good. And it seems particularly short-sighted to be putting it under existential threat at the present moment. I know that probably the Conservative front bench would not agree with me. Uh, but we have think tanks, policy centres, regulators, even reporters, I think, should be doing a much better job at picking away <laughs> at this complex new paradigm. And, the BBC, the, and really the BBC's capabilities ought to be central to the debate rather than completely marginal uh, and the debate not to be happening. Um, it would be a mistake, in my opinion, uh, not to include platform technologies and how we want to, and imagining how we want our public sphere and, society, and uh, societies to work, in the same way that we consider the BBC, uh, the press, and other utilities within this picture. Um, we've heard the BBC actually express its desire to become a platform, but I haven't actually seen any indication that anybody who has power at the BBC really understands what that actually means. Uh, so it might be invigorating to actually see a public service organisation help define standards for digital publishing, which can help all journalism rather than simply uh, a, a, a small, confined uh, part of it. Um, I think there's a role for centres of excellence like this one, like Crash, 
uh, like the Tau Centre at Columbia, which um, I run, to foster and promote the exchange of ideas around civic technology and communications. So what happens to the current class of news publishers um, is much less a, a much less important question than what kind of news and information society we want to create and how we can help shape this. None of this is meant to say, I think it's, we should be doing everything we possibly can to preserve... I mean, I think we should be doing everything we possibly can to preserve the Guardian, but I would say that, wouldn't I? But I don't think this is about preserving what is there at the moment. I think it is about looking at what is valuable about what we have at the moment and not losing it in a transition which is more profound and more destabilising than anything we've seen before. Um, and actually, now is the time to do it as well, because those questions are still in flux. Uh, you know, this hasn't yet... Um, uh, there's a great academic in America called Zeynep Tefeci, who is... Um, who is uh, Turkish, who is a sociologist who writes about um, technology. And she says, you know, th this, has a, this system hasn't ossified yet. Uh, you know, there are lots of things where people are able to be persuaded or argued with or lobbied, um, and we should be doing that now, uh, because once, if you like, the, sort of the, the die is cast and once those figures of scale increase, it's too late. Then it will be too late to go back. So we should be doing that right now. Um, I am sentimental, has to be said, about the roar of the presses and the filthy, filthy offices and the terrible nicotine habits of uh, people who are um, in newsrooms like the Spotlight Newsroom. Um, but I think those trappings of journalism are probably best consigned to the dustbin of history. But I think many of us who are le legitimately concerned that journalism in all its forms doesn't emerge from this period of technological advancement weakened rather than strengthened uh, and we really want to see the protections and resources ex uh, that we had extended to future generations of journalism, journalists however that happens um, just as journalism companies are thinking about how they shift the production towards distributed model so platform companies need to think about their own internal organisations I think to support journalism and active journalism without a commitment to reliable information, social media ultimately comes unstuck as an economic force. I'd I would actually like Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Jack Dorsey, Larry Page, Tim Cook, and whichever man, um, or hopefully woman, so, you know, um, who is the next communications billionaire, to really consider themselves as publishers, not simply a technology company. I'd like them to take seriously the fragility of good journalism and what steps are needed to make sure it thrives and recognise their important role in that. Maybe next time Mark Zuckerberg's asked if he's a platform or a publisher, he'll answer, what's the difference? Thank you. And questions. Um, Emily's uh, agreed to answer a few questions, and we've got until uh, about half past. There will be roving mics, so please wait for the microphone to arrive. But if you'd like to put your hand up, if you want to... Well, you can shout. No questions. No journalists. There's one oh, there is a question. Right up no, there. lots so, of questions. Uh, here we go. <laughs> There's one in the middle over there. Thank you very much for that. I thought it was a wonderful articulation of the problems we're facing uh, with the concentration of ownership in this area. I just was wondering to push you a little bit whether you thought that the con the, uh, the concentration of ownership was just to do was just a problem in the space of journalism, or whether it was a sort of a broader agenda. When you look at um, behaviour like um, Facebook sort of changing, insisting on people changing their names, Salman Rushdie yeah. being forced to um, adjust his name and, and drag queens and other sort yeah. of um, groups of people that have been targeted. I mean, I, you know, I think it's an excellent question. As I say, I really don't want to demonise Facebook because I think they've done, I, I should have said this, I think they've done far more good probably in the world than they have harm. But the real name policy is a great example of how when a company like Facebook started out, and, you know, it was about 2007 is really when it started to um, seek bigger audiences and it decides that in order to keep down dissent and and you know trolls and spam it will insist on people having their real name and tying their and only having one identity and tying it to their um to their uh, uh, uh 
email address. And as you say, sort of that actually there's been a really interesting battle with both the trans community and uh, drag queens in the States who said, but we have two identities. Why, are you ask, why should it be down to you, Mark Zuckerberg, telling us who we have to be online? Why can't we try on other identities? We all have different identities. Um, but it's one of those ways in which a, 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 an engineering uh, design, sort of solving one problem, creates another. And, uh, you know, they have actually rode back on, on, on some of that because it genuinely hadn't occurred to them. I mean, I think that's the other thing, which is sometimes when you meet engineers who are working on these products in bars or what, and they're always, you know, sort of 23 and their life has been awesome and they've just come out of Stanford and everything is great. Uh, and then you say, but when you've designed this, you know, what about a disaffected community, et cetera? And they're like, oh, we haven't really thought of that. So, so it's not necessarily, I think, I think it isn't just concentration of ownership, as you put it, is, is definitely not just about journalism. I've, I've chosen to talk about journalism because I know about it. Um, but when I said, you know, social media is really sort of moving, you know, beyond the boundaries of, of its current sort of, you know, at, and people have seen social media as being, well, it's sort of something that's over there that I don't really have to engage with. I mean, yes, I have a Facebook profile. I don't really like posting anything on it. Um, WeChat in China, which is actually the same size as Facebook, slightly bigger, I think, has a banking license. Uh, Facebook will have a banking license before we know where we are. You know, so so these, some, of, some of these things, I think, are significant issues of competition. Um, but yet they're very difficult to actually sort of articulate in terms of existing competition law. Europe, I mean, you know, we're just about we're sort of debating whether or not we should exit from Europe. Uh, actually, it's one of the few areas where uh, European policy has been by far and away the most effective, which is being able to, for instance, um, you know, and again, I don't even know that it was a particularly great thing that they did, but the right to be forgotten is something that was imposed on Google by uh, the European um, Department of Justice or whatever it's called. Um, but so, so, yes, I don't think it is just journalism. I think it's in every single area. And, and that's why I can't understand why there isn't more policy debate, which is actually sort of focused on the roles of extent, you know, extensible network platform companies. There was another question in the middle. Uh, Thank you, Emily. That was really good. Um, picking up on that point, but also in general, when we look at the generations, you mentioned millennials, we looked at these young hands in the young, audience. Young, attractive people. With yeah. Money. Do you yes. think that these reasons that policy or taking seriously the trust of this information, these guys trust, maybe don't trust the media anymore, mm. trust social media, but the people who are looking at policy, don't understand this stuff. The BBC maybe don't realise how important these guys spend. They don't watch TV anymore, probably. They decide what it, they digest. Um, they're not being dictated to. Um, think, how much is it that, that we're missing those people coming in and helping us? I mean, I think so, 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 so I think that's a good point. And, and the answer is I don't know, because who knows what goes on in the head of policymakers. All I can say is that the conversations I've had with them um, always start from the basis that they that they don't really understand the progression of unless unless they are sort of technologists and technologists do understand, uh, but they te te you know they're busy people. They know that the t Today program is important. They know they've always read a certain newspaper. They they might even look at their Facebook pages a lot. Um, somebody who uh, works at one of the new media companies told me the other day that they were sort of dealing with something like thirty different contracts simultaneously for different social platforms. So I think that there's an element, you know, through which sort of people are overwhelmed with it. And regulation is always slow. John Norton's an expert on this. It's always behind policy. You know, one of the great problems we've had, you know, since the beginning of time, practically, is how do we regulate uh, technologies that we don't quite understand and that we don't know how are going to emerge. So there is a genuine concern here as well about... Uh, we don't know where this is going. We don't know how it's going to grow. Uh, what the last thing we want is to hedge in um, opportunity and potential. Uh, in America, sort of regulation is absolutely the last thing you do. There's almost there is no. I mean, there's there's no policy debate, or very little policy debate in America. But there's a lot of cultural debate, um, and I think that here, uh, the voices that you've talked about are the ones that are missing from that debate, uh, and um, I think that what's happen happening in politics, both on both sides of the Atlantic, 
is probably a sort of a wake-up call to that as well, which is that conversations and communities are now formed in places that the mainstream isn't looking, you know, and, and that's everywhere from uh, local politics right the way through to sort of militant activism, right the way through to terrorism, you know, kind of, uh, and, and, and that is, a, I think, something which means that if you don't have people who are completely at one with those means of communication, that you're definitely missing something from your, from your policy initiative. Mike, coming down. Enjoyed that very much. Um, I seem to have read a number of quotes recently basically saying that BuzzFeed, HuffPost, etc., um, justifying not paying journalists for stories at all on the basis that that meant that the writers were unbiased. And yet I also see the BBC and The Guardian seeking news feeds from the public. Right. And I, I guess they're doing that in the belief that this is engagement, mm -hmm. but I wonder if they're not actually all part of a process of cannibalising journalism and not paying journalists. So, so, so I think there are two issues there, one of which is the not paying of journalists. Um, I'm fairly sure that BuzzFeed does pay all of its journalists. I know that Huffington Post was, based on the, uh, basis of, was, was founded on the basis of guest posts, uh, and the idea that people would be unbiased, I think, is probably not true. It's more the idea that they would be transparent. So, in other words, you know, you're an academic and you publish a paper and you want to write a blog post about it. The Huff Huffington Post is a platform where you can do that, but we're not going to pay you because we, we haven't commissioned you and it does your paper and your um, discourse good. Um, however, BuzzFeed does have a community platform where people post things for free. Uh, the Guardian, I was instrumental in pushing it to integrate with the social web. So I'm part of the problem here. I thought I'd admit that right at the end. Um, but it's not, but, but in a way, I think that that's a separate issue to the, not, to the not paying of journalists. I think that the inclusion of citizens, eyewitness media, whatever you want to call it, within uh, professional media has already happened. And actually, in many ways, we are doing those people a disservice. We did a report at the Tower Centre um, last year which uh, looked at the use of um, what we call sort of, say, eyewitness media or user-generated content, which is a horrible phrase, in mainstream news broadcasts. And it's pervasive. It's, sort of, it's, it's kind of everywhere. Um, and every single major event that happens now, you will see through the lens of somebody else's uh, mobile phone um, before a professional news crew gets there, without a shadow of a doubt. And yet there's no attribution. There's no, often no credit. There's no real consent involved in that. You talk to newsrooms, they don't really have a sort of a practice about what they do with it. I think that sort of the Guardian, we worked quite hard to try and get standards, which meant that people uh, understood what they were, what, their, what our transaction was. Um, we did it in order to, I think, that sort of divide between professional journalism and, you know, there are many people out there who write about video... Uh, cover things every bit as well as professional journalists do, sometimes because they are experts in the field themselves. You know, so some of the best people who write about science are scientists. Uh, some of the people who, best people who you know, write about gardening are actually gardeners. Um, so, so, so I think more, it's more about how do we actually sort of you know, make that. Um, it's about creating, if you like, sort of communities of interest and value and values you know, the Guardian has very specific values that we want to sort of involve people uh, with our journalism because we think that actually that's how you get proper dimensions on stories as well. I mean, it's, it's kind of a... Comment threads are, you know, very a, a sort of, you know, regarded as a terrible thing and social media is often regarded as a terrible thing. But if you go back, you know, three or four decades and really, really read coverage from the time about what was happening in politics uh, or what was happening in certain social, um, sort of certain social situations, you, you, know, you, you really miss something. You know, there is no... That sort of the, 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 the one way 
tablets from, from the mount are something I don't think we would ever want to go back to, even if we could. And then it's really about getting an, an equitable uh, and transparent relationship with the people who contribute. But everybody, I mean, everybody should be aware, if they're not, that they contribute every day. You know, you, you, <laughs> you publish, people publish all the time. There is so much stuff out there. Um, and actually, there was, there was a, uh, somebody, what, somebody did meet the Pope from the media last week. It was the chief executive of Instagram who went to sit and talk to the Pope, not the chief executive of Getty Images, but the, the, the chief executive of Instagram went to talk to the Pope about imagery and the power of imagery. So, you know, and, and he, he is now regarded as being, you know, the person who controls the world's images. <coughs> we are out of time. Um, if you've enjoyed this, even if you haven't enjoyed this, even if you haven't enjoyed there it. are more <laughs> events uh, tomorrow and the day after. Tomorrow, uh, I'd like to say the hottest ticket in town, but you don't need a ticket to come along. Uh, Emily, in conversation with Mary Beard, uh, again on the theme of Facebook eating the world, uh, that's tomorrow at five. Uh, if you want to come to the symposium, which is on Friday from 2 to 5.30, you do need to register for that, but registration is free. However, you do need to register. So please do come along to those additional events. Uh, but the only thing that remains is to thank, once again, the Blavatnik Family Foundation and the Widenfeld Hoffman Trust for sponsoring these events. Uh, but above all, for this wonderful integration of issues around corporate versus state power, public and private interests, free speech, and trustworthy speech, uh, we should thank Emily for a really wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you.